Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. My name is Bob. In this episode, we're going to be looking at solving an ignition problem in a four-cylinder Japanese motorcycle. So what we're looking at here is my 1980 Suzuki GSX 1100E. 40 years old, some 350,000 kilometres, that's about 219,000 miles. Really in need of, a, of an overhaul, but um, I've yet to find time. Burns a little bit of oil, leaks a little bit of oil, as they do when they get this old. I use the bike basically for short trips around town, just running errands. Coming back from an errand just recently, the bike started running rough. I had a reasonably full tank of fuel, so we certainly weren't running out of fuel. And I thought, oh, maybe it's failed to plug. And I nursed her home, pulled up in the drive, shut her down. First thing I did was reach for my infrared thermometer. The bike's cold now, but this is the process. There's a little red point that you can see, so you just move across getting the temperature this is 25 degrees which is about what it is in the room 25 degrees 25 degrees and 25 degrees determining where the foul plug is is based on the fact that it will have a lower header temperature than the surrounding cylinders what did I find? I found something very interesting. So when I scanned the temperatures, I found header 1 had a temperature of a little bit more than 80 degrees. Header 2, 200 degrees. You're immediately thinking 1 is where the uh, foul plug is. However, moving on. Header 3 had 200 degrees. Going for the trick here. And header 4 just over 80 degrees. One and four, both failed. Nah, that's possible, but unlikely. What's more likely is a coil problem. You see, on this style of bike, Kawasaki, Suzuki's, Hondas, etc. of that era, they all run a system of two coils with two leads per coil. So, one coil has a lead to cylinder one and cylinder four and the second coil has a lead to cylinder two and cylinder three. See where I'm going? One and four are not firing and there will be a coil for one and four which is probably not firing. Now, why is it not firing? Well, I don't know but I'm about to investigate. I hope you all watch this video all the way through, but I know some of you have tuned in to see if I've got an answer for your particular problem. Hopefully, I only have one problem, which uh, shortly will be fixed, but uh, I think it's time I did a bit of theory so that I can at least give you some guidance as to where your problem may lie. This first diagram shows the layout of the system on the bike that we are looking at. We have a signal generator which covers both the pickup and in this case a transistorized ignition system. It sends signals to coils for cylinders 1 and 4 and coils a coil for cylinders 2 and 3. This is a diagrammatic representation of a coil, an ignition coil. It has what we call the primary coil, primary circuit. It's fed from the battery, so we have plus and minus, and we have the coil running here. We have an iron core, and then we have a secondary coil. It shares a common earth, however, its output goes to the spark plug is which one that delivers the spark. The primary coil 
is the thicker wire, less turns, secondary coil is a thinner wire, many more turns. As I said, this is a diagrammatic representation of the coil. The actual structure of a coil is not identical to that. This one just makes it a little, under, a little easier to understand. In a real coil, the structure is a outer primary coil surrounding the secondary coil passing through the middle of those two coils is the iron core. Going back to our diagram, the way the coil works is that we have a voltage across the primary coil coupled with the iron core and think electromagnets here we have a magnetic field so the secondary coil is bathed in a magnetic field. What happens is to fire the spark plug is that the uh, signal generator shuts the power off to this coil. That collapses the magnetic field which in turn induces a current in the secondary coil. Current has to go somewhere, it goes down through the circuit and fires the spark plug and that's easy how it works so motor rotates the system shuts down the power to this this one fires off the spark to the spark plug and we get ignition having a quick look at the coil system I have bundled the various components after the coil the leads the plug cap and the spark plug together with the coil and I'm just going to mention briefly coil sticks. They're a later development. Each spark plug gets an individual coil which is mounted on a short spark plug cap and feeds directly to the spark plug. Now what can happen there is of course that uh, you either have individual wires to each coil stick because you've got a coil per plug now and they can, be turn they can turn the coil on and off as required. Or alternatively, going back to the original system I just showed you, you could split the wire that goes to the coils for one and four and run those wires to the coil sticks on one and four. Either way works. What sort of problems do we get with coils? Well, I've gone to electrical terminology here and I'll say that we have either a short circuit or an open cir circuit. A short circuit is essentially the current flow has left the scene before it got to the spark plug. An open circuit is the current flow never, never gets past first or second base to get to the spark plug. So what are the short circuit problems you can encounter? Usually it involves a crack in the system. A crack in the coil where the current goes out the, ed the edge of the coil and onto usually the frame, hopefully not the petrol tank. Alternatively, a uh, crack in the plug lead where again it leaves the plug lead and goes to the motor. Crack in the plug cap. Again, it uh, goes through that crack and into the nearest earth. Or the spark plug itself can have a crack down through the insulator and it just goes straight out of there to the nearest earth. What you need to appreciate is the spark plug usually has a fair amount of resistance to jump. So any available earth the current can get before that, which is an easier circuit, it will take. Okay, the sort of open circuit issues you get are a crack in one of the coils, in one of the actual coil windings and or split. So what you get is uh, the coil is invariably heated by the motor and the coil expands, the wire coil, this is, the coil body expands, the wire coil of course separates at the split and there's no current flow. The important diagnostic feature there is that you have uh, a spark when the motor is cold 
and you don't have a spark when the motor is hot because of the separation of the, the wire. The other ones are problem with the lead. Usually if there's a break in the lead wire there's enough voltage there for the current to jump the separation. However the other thing you get is that the leads either pull slightly out of the coil itself or the lead pulls slightly out of the uh, plug cap and you don't see that physically but you can find it with testing. The other one is the plug cap. The plug cap. It can fracture inside and the components separate. And finally we can have a foul spark plug where there is no passage for the current to get to earth because of the fouling on the plug. Moving on from the coil, we're going to talk about signal generation or the means by which the coil is turned on and off. I'm going to talk about three systems, all of which need to work with the battery. It goes without saying that if you're starting to troubleshoot such a system, make sure your battery is good and it is fully charged or close to fully charged. I'm not going to cover uh, magneto systems or capacitor discharge systems or systems that just run on a, a generator coil. Uh, they are similar in that they, they're all getting a power supply either from the magneto, the capacitor or the generator but um, it's a level of complexity I don't want to introduce into this talk because we're really talking about four cylinder motorbikes, modern, relatively modern, four cylinder motorbikes and um, they are on magnetos <laughs> and uh, so yeah and if you put a CDI system on that you've done that for a special purpose you've done battery elimination or something like that so we're talking about standard battery uh, ignition systems there are three main types there are points ignition transistorized circuit ignition which is what the bike that we're looking at today has and computer ignition well that's what I've loosely called them anyhow we'll start with points ignition it's made up of three components a cam, breaker points and a capacitor with all these systems we'll treat them as though the triggering device is on the end of the crankshaft doesn't have to be there and some bikes it's on the end of the camshaft blah 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 but we'll treat it as though it's on the end of the crankshaft for simplicity with the point system you have a cam you have two points, one of which is fixed, one of which is on an arm that moves. There is a rubbing block. There's a rubbing block between that arm and the cam lobe. When the cam lobe is up, it forces the two points apart and you get the break in the circuit which produces the spark. Okay. A pretty simple system, but it's prone to wear. So, what are the problems you get? First off, point gap closes. What happens there is two things. One is this rubbing block that's on the point on the breaker arm wears away. They need to be lubricated. They're hard to lubricate. The second thing that happens is you set set the gap by having the lobe directly on so you've opened the two points apart and you set that gap in between it's screws that hold everything in position sometimes those screws just weren't tight enough just come loose and the points close no matter what the cam's doing the points don't open so two things there uh, the rubbing block breaks off, wears away, or alternatively the points come loose and the points close. Okay, your next one is earth leakage. By its very nature the points sit on insulators. If they didn't have insulators uh, they would earth directly to the motor because they're screwed to the motor. If the insulators break down or they're missing people change points and ah, what do we need that little washer for anyhow if they're missing there will be 
no spark because it's just going straight to earth at the point system. Finally, the capacitor. Capacitors are there to smooth the current flow when the points break. Otherwise it ends up like a bit of an arc welder and the zap and after a, not too many revolutions uh, both sets of points uh, melted away. So the capacitor does a very useful job like that. It's very necessary. However, it can play up. It can outright fail. It usually just turns to burning of the points. The other thing it can do is just take the charge and sometimes it just represents itself as a misfire. It's, uh, it's easy enough to diagnose and hard enough to diagnose. You need to substitute a known good capacitor of the right specification and sometimes you need to be a little wary of new old stock because those capacitors could just deteriorate with age. Some of them do. The next one we're looking at is transistorized ignition. And that's what the bike we're looking at today has. Components, it has a set of pickup coils. This is how it knows what the crank's doing. It has a rotating magnet and it has a transistor circuit. The way it works is a number of pickup coils, in this case two, and a magnet that has a lobe on it, a sort of cam, and it rotates on the end of the crankshaft. And as it rotates past a pickup coil, you get a change in the magnetic flux. In fact, what's happening is this is acting like a bit of an alternator. You've got an AC current that's flowing to the transistor circuit and it's changing direction as the magnet goes through and that then causes the transistor circuit to turn the coil on and off. Very simple, very nice, much better system than points. And of course the transistor circuit which is just about taking the AC circuit and turning it into a switch on and off for the coil. What are the problems? They don't normally have any problems, but first off, the pickup coils. They could fail, that's unlikely. They could lose continuity. The next one is the transistor circuit. Usually if that fails, you just haven't got spark anywhere. And the magnet. The magnets are very robust, but what can happen is that, you know, you've dropped the bike. Maybe not even at speed. It's fallen over, it's broken the timing cover. You have uh, looked at the uh, pickup coils, they look alright, uh, broke the timing cover but it also hit the magnet. Magnet looks alright as well, but what's happened is there's a tiny fracture in it. Now you're riding down the road and all of a sudden, uh, well you could have a massive dis disintegration but more likely you have the little lobe uh, breaks off at the fracture and uh, just flies off, doesn't go into space because you've got the timing cover on I hope and um, it just goes around and gets uh, attached to the nearest bit of steel and you go and you look in there and you may not notice early on that it's broken off and you're still wondering why you've got no spark uh, that's the sort of things that can happen there right -o, the third system we'll look at is computerized ignition here the components are a Hall Effect chip, a trigger wheel a fixed magnet and of course a computer. How this one works as the pickup area is that you have a Hall Effect chip sits on one side, a magnet that uh, sits there on the other side. There's a magnetic field between the Hall Effect chip and the magnet which is fixed. A trigger wheel is attached to the crank and it's going around and it's got a little knife and that knife slices through the magnetic field and that induces a change in the Hall Effect chip which then sends a signal to the computer that says hey it just went past and that tells the computer where the crank is in relation to uh, what's happening with the motor. You also might hear that setup referred to as a crank sensor and that's, that's exactly what it is. Okay, the problems. The Hall Effect chip and the computer. The Hall Effect chip, you know, is in the motor. It's hot. 
it's vibrated, it's unhappy. Every now and then they just give up the ghost. A computer. Now, it's unlikely a computer will fail outright. And the computer can be deceived or can deceive you. So you've sat down, you've got absolutely no spark. And you're thinking you've you know you're thinking your coils are playing up, etc. etc. However, it can be as simple as the computer works off a number of sensors in the motor. And some of those or what some of those sensors are telling the computer is critical to the motor's operation and the computer gets word from one sensor that a particular thing is out of range and it says okay I've got to save the motor here and just turns off the ignition so sometimes you've got to think about what the computer is looking at and whether that is the cause of your ignition failure of course it goes without saying there that if you've got a diagnostic system for the computer that really helps although it can be deceiving as well. Coil problems can be temperature related. So what we're about to do now is check the spark. Now I've made a little tester. All it is is a spark plug with an alligator clip which clips on the motor. But what you'll really see is I think might be better with the background okay so what you really see is that I have a wide gap it's about five six millimeters about a quarter of an inch and the reason for that is that when you when you've got uh, the compressed fuel air mixture in the cylinder and is about to fire the spark. That provides a certain amount of resistance to the spark and if your spark is pretty weak then uh, what will happen is it, it just won't fire. And But you could pull the spark plug out, put the lead on it, check it and see a spark and think well that's all working. What happens when you open the gap like this is that it has to jump a much bigger gap Basically, it's got to have enough grunt uh, to jump that separation. And if it's got that amount of grunt, then it'll also fire this petrol air mix. So, we're going to use this to just see if there's any hint of ignition left in that coil. And that's our first test. To do this, I pull the lead and cap off the spark plug on cylinder 1 and connect it to the tester and then connect the alligator clip to one of the fins on the engine. Then it is a simple matter of turning the ignition on, pushing the starter button and watching for a spark. No spark, so I replace the lead for cylinder 1, but as a further check I remove the lead and plug cap from the spark plug on cylinder 2 and connect it to the tester, again connecting the alligator clip to an engine fin. This time we can easily see the spark jumping the gap on the tester. So at this stage we know that the coil is not working, be it hot or cold, which means it's unlikely that one of the, uh, either the primary or secondary coil has, has split internally. I always work on balance of probabilities in these sort of things, so at this stage I'm thinking the coil is probably okay. So I'm going back to the signal generator. But as always, I'm going to be looking at the connectors and the wiring because connectors can be just as much problem as actual electrical components. Off with the timing cover to reveal the pickup coils and the magnetic rotor. As I rotate the crank you can easily see the two pickup coils, one on each side of the rotating single lobe of the magnetic rotor. 
As the load passes each pickup coil, it changes the current wave from positive to negative or vice versa, which causes the transistor circuit to momentarily turn off the current to the coil, which in turn fires the spark plug. First thing I do is inspect the wiring. The pickup coil wires are intact and attached. The transistor circuit is up near the battery and then I head up the frame to the coils themselves. I do a check on the leads to the spark plugs on cylinders 1 and 4 and then look at the wires leading to the primary side of that coil. What I find, which might be hard to see in the video, is that the positive wire or signal wire to the coil is broken off and I think I've found the problem. On the bench, with the coil degreased and washed, I'm ready to repair the broken wire. The terminal is encased in epoxy resin, and I'm using a small hacksaw to cut it away. Being careful, of course, not to damage the terminal in the process. The terminal is brass, and I carefully cut around it, finally cleaning it up with a wire brush. Then I trim the end off the broken off wire and remove the insulation from the last 6mm or quarter of an inch or so. Then it is on to soldering. I first apply a bead of solder to the terminal itself. Then some solder to the end of the wire. before joining them both together. I'm resealing the terminal in a fast curing epoxy resin. After mixing the epoxy, I'm adding talcum powder to give it sufficient body to be moulded into the shape of the original casing. It's not critical to cover the terminal of course, not all coils have them covered, but I'm holding to the original design here. With the coil reinstalled and the bike back together, it's time to test the spark from the coil for cylinders 1 and 4. As you can see, it's a nice fat one. What more could you ask for? This video has ended up a little long. I'm sorry about that. I try not to make them this long, but I think this one just needs to be the length it is. There's a lot of information that's packed in. I could split it into parts, but I think it would lose its impact if I did that. So, I'm sorry it's so long, uh, but I do hope you found it useful. And if you've got an ignition problem, it's actually given you the information you need to solve your problem. I'd like to thank you once again for watching. I'd love it if you give the video a thumbs up. And, by all means, share it amongst your friends. Share it widely. Anybody. If you like videos about making, fixing, maintaining or renovating things, then White Dog Garage YouTube channel is a channel you should probably be subscribed to. If you haven't already subscribed, well, think about subscribing. It's easy, just hit the bar down below that says subscribe. While you're there, ding the bell so that you get a reminder, a notification from YouTube next time a video comes out on the White Dog Garage YouTube channel. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to talking to you next time.